please take a second to subscribe, then like and share afterwards. We can really use your support. Thank you. In the previous episode, we revealed the ultimate jubilee, with the ultimate return concerning Jesus Christ and the restoration of all things as they were meant to be. Now, we were meant to leave the series at that. However, this still leaves the big question. When is all of this expected to happen? And what is the sequence of events to take place when it does? We decided we'd tackle these questions head on, based on all the information that we have. This does not mean that we're going to try to set dates for them to occur. However, we are simply going to reveal what the deeply embedded messages in the Bible is telling us, and it has a lot to say. God's prophetic calendar is being revealed to His church concerning the end times, and we have been given discernment on how to unlock a number of scriptures to make it known. God's calendar is 100% reliable, as it was revealed to His people on Mount Sinai. The calendar contains all the appointed times for His people to celebrate. The book of Daniel and the 70 weeks can be viewed through the prophetic lens of the Shemitah, the seven-year cycle that God revealed through Moses in the book of Leviticus. This prophecy was explained at length in episode 12. On God's calendar, the Shemitah begins on the 1st of Tishri and ends on the 29th day of Elul exactly seven years later. On our calendar, Elul 29 falls somewhere between September and October, depending on the year. And the Shemitah is connected to every major world event on God's calendar, most importantly, the Tribulation and the Second Coming of the Messiah. God has given us a seventh day, weekly Sabbath rest, and a seventh year of rest. This is called a leap of years, or a seven-year sabbatical cycle. And when this seventh sabbatical year wasn't observed and adhered to, it would be a time of trouble, or curse, for the nation. God has a 7,000-year plan for mankind on the earth. Since we know of God's calendar, it seems very logical to believe that the first day of creation was on the first of Tishri in 4004 BC, followed by 35 sinless years ending in 3970 BC. These 35 years match with the number of years that Jesus the Messiah was in this world, that is, 33 and a half years plus the nine months in his mother's womb. The moment he atoned for our sins is the very exact amount of time to the moment sin entered the world. Now for the question, did the Jews keep the Super Sabbath as a Shemitah year as God commanded? No, they didn't. They did not allow the land to rest for a period of 490 years. If you divide 490 by 7, you get exactly 70 Shemitahs. In other words, the Jews ignored God's commandment to allow the land to rest for 70 Shemitah cycles. Now we know why they were removed from their land and into Babylonian captivity for exactly 70 years. With this background, we can begin to understand the 70 weeks of years prophecy that was to follow the release of the Jews from captivity. We are told in the prophecy of Daniel in chapter 9 that the Messiah would be cut off in the last of the 69th week. So if we use the lunar calendar using 360 days per year and take 69 times 7 times 360, we get 173,880 days. Then we divide to our Gregorian calendar years and we get 476 solar years. This means 476 years since the start of the prophecy, 
The final seven missing years must conform to this pattern before the Lord returns to the earth to set up his kingdom. So now, if we ask the question that, if answered correctly, unlocks the past and the future, is there a date that we know for certain, a stake in the ground to measure all dates from, in order to know with certainty all the dates we want to know, such as the date that Jesus was born, when he died, and when the tribulation will begin? The answer is yes. I believe that God has provided us with this stake in the ground in order for his saints to begin to prepare and warn the lost. There are three decrees between Ezra 1 and 7 that command the building of the new temple, but not for the city itself. This is where many get this counting wrong. It could only be in 445 BC when Artaxerxes, the same king who allowed Nehemiah to rebuild the city of Jerusalem in the month of Nisan. And Daniel tells us precisely how many years we are to count from this decree to the time Messiah is to be cut off or crucified. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Daniel 9, 25-26 So by counting 476 years after 445 BC, we get to 31 AD and the month of April, and that lands on the time of Passover, the very time when Christ Jesus was crucified. Now let's do a time test using the Shemitah cycle with 31 AD as the crucifixion date. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up. Hosea 6.2 the Hosea prophecy is referring to a period after the Messiah is cut off. If we look to the day to 1000 years key that we see in 2 Peter 3.8, then it is saying it will be a period of 2000 years after the death of Christ for him to revive us. Now recall, just before the rapture of the church takes place, God will revive or raise the dead first. This will be but a moment before we who are still alive to be raised. If we do the same conversion using 360 day years, it brings us to the year of 2030 for the tribulation to end and the second coming of Christ to occur. Minus seven years of tribulation and that brings us to 2023 during the Feast of Trumpets. How many years does this add up to when we reach Christ's second coming if we are correct about 2030? First, if we look at the number of years between 3970 BC, the year sin first came into the world, and 31 AD when Christ paid for those sins, is 4001 years. So, if the tribulation begins by the end of 2023 and ends in 2030, how many years do we see from the cross to the end of the tribulation? It is 1,999 years. Add 4,001 years that passed from the creation to the crucifixion. It gives us precisely 6,000 years. Now, of course, if we add Christ's millennial reign of a thousand years, we get seven thousand years. And before that millennial reign will take place, the final battle at Armageddon will commence.
the white throne of judgment that happens after the millennial reign of Christ and before the new heaven and the new earth for our eternity to begin. This concludes 7,000 years of finishing God's plan for mankind's redemption. But wait, what about the 35 years at the very beginning from the day of creation to the day sin entered the world? Remember, during this period, there was no clock ticking per se. Although time was counting, mankind was living in perfect unity with God. And that is why Christ's perfect life of roughly 33 and a half years plus the nine months in the womb adds up to 35 years. The book of Leviticus is yet another key source that tells us about our future. In it, God gave the children of Israel seven feasts. And we know positively that these feasts were a prophetic grid for this future. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. The word feast in the Hebrew is moed, meaning an appointed festival. Now, with the word convocation, is the Hebrew mikra, meaning a public meeting or a dress rehearsal. That's right. God is saying that they were to have these feasts for his present day purposes and for something that is appointed to take place in the future time. Four of these feasts take place in the spring months of every year and three that occur in the autumn months. The first is the Feast of Passover. As we have seen back in episode 17, this feast was to commemorate the passing over of the Spirit of God over the homes of the Israelites. This was a dress rehearsal for the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Therefore, the Feast of Passover has been fulfilled by Christ. The second feast was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This was the day after Passover. For seven days, the children of Israel could not eat leavened bread. Leaven represents sin in the Bible. Seven is the number of perfection. With Christ's perfect life and death, he removes that sin. Christ was buried during the feast. Therefore, the Feast of Unleavened Bread has been fulfilled by Christ. The third was the Feast of First Fruits. On that day, the priest would wave the first fruits of the harvest in the air as an offering to God. But now Christ is risen from the dead, and he has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 1 Corinthians 15:20. Christ is the first fruit of the resurrection, meaning his saints will also be resurrected from the dead. Therefore, the feast of first fruits has been fulfilled by Christ. The fourth was the feast of Pentecost. This came precisely 50 days after first fruits. 50 is the number of Jubilee. And as we've carefully examined in the first four episodes of this series, as well as the seventh Shemitah that we've seen in episode 12, Pentecost means 50. In Leviticus, it was also called the Feast of Weeks, where they offered a new grain offering to the Lord. On the day of Pentecost, after Christ's death, the disciples were baptized by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the Feast of Pentecost has been fulfilled by Christ and the Holy Spirit. And they were all fulfilled in correct order. Now, this concludes the first four feasts that occurred in the spring. These four all had to do with the planting. But after the planting comes the harvest. Now we arrive at the final three feasts. 
and they have yet to be fulfilled at the time of producing this episode. The fifth feast was the Feast of Trumpets. On this feast, the priest would blow the shofar to usher in a time of rest. This points us to our rest from the difficulties of the life we're living. This tells us it will be the time of the rapture. No one knows the day or the hour correct, meaning which of the days of this feast? Which hour of these two days? At the time of preparing this episode, the next Feast of Trumpets is just months away, on September 15th to the 17th, 2023. And that would have to be Jerusalem time. The rapture is linked to the shofar, or the trumpet, in the Bible. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. If the tribulation does begin by the end of 2023, then the rapture would have to take place this year. And the Shemitah? Remember, in episode 12, we mentioned every successive Shemitah from the 1950s up to 2001, 2008, 2015, and what took place in 2022. We saw the worst stock crash since 2008, and it marks 2023 as the beginning of a new seven-year cycle. The sixth holy feast was the Feast of Atonement. This was to cause affliction of the soul for the people. No work was to be done. This points to Christ's second coming. When he comes, it will indeed cause affliction to all who see him here on earth. The seventh and final feast was the Feast of Tabernacles. This was the seventh feast taking place in the seventh month for seven days. And taking place for seven days. This is the number of perfection, ending all the feasts and it marks the final full rest and extremely significant for the end times. This marks the people's dwelling with God and God with his people in the tabernacle together, eternity with him. This rapture is referred to in the New Testament as the wedding day of the Messiah. The current church body is called the bride. Going back to the most ancient of days, the Jewish groom would prepare to marry his bride. He would leave his father's house to go down and meet with the bride and her family. They would share a glass of wine to seal the betrothal. Afterwards, he would tell his bride that he wouldn't drink of the wine again until they shared again in his father's house. This is precisely why Jesus said to his disciples in John 14 that it was going to his father's house to prepare a place for him and his bride, and would return to retrieve her when the father would send him to do so. We are the bride of Christ, the church body. Wedding tradition stated that only the groom's father knew when he would send his son to retrieve the bride. That's why Matthew 24, 36 states, Now, concerning the day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, except the Father only. We are to watch very closely and very earnestly for these days during the Feast of Trumpets each year, and not in North American time, but in Jerusalem time, and not from the morning, but from sundown, as days do not begin in the morning, but rather at sundown. So, if we were to watch the days of September 15th to 17th, it needs to be Jerusalem time, beginning in the evening on Friday the 15th, until the evening of the 17th, as the sun sets. We cannot be predicting days of the rapture, but it is extremely important to remind each other to be extra watchful 
during this feast each year. Here on Prophecies Uncovered.